Good evening and welcome to the programme where police and public get together to help solve crime. Calls from viewers after last month's programme have already led to seven arrests, including one for murder. Once again, tonight we have faces and reconstructions of events which police are hoping you might recognise. If you do, the detectives and BBC researchers here are waiting for your call. Our number, as always, 01 8055. Tonight's cases range across the country. They embrace a variety of crimes. A Jeff Capes lookalike, a conman who's been preying on old people across the north of England. A driving instructor who was stabbed on the doorstep of his home in Hull. The robbers who were caught on camera as they stole a valuable ring from a London jeweller's. And a horrific discovery made by schoolchildren on a nature trail. Just over five months ago, during the Muslim holy month of Ramadan, a religious teacher, Abdur Rashid, was murdered in London's East End. The killing shocked the Bangladeshi community where he lived, and police and local people are hoping Crime Watch viewers may be able to help find whoever killed him. Witnesses and friends in Whitechapel have helped us reconstruct what is known about the last day of his life. But our film begins 12 miles away from where he lived, in Essex. It's lunchtime on Wednesday the 27th of April. A group of children were following a nature trail on the edge of Epping Forest. What's that? It was the body of 46-year-old Abdur Rashid. It had been wrapped in a bedspread, tied with a sash cord and set alight. For the Muslims, the burning of the body is the ultimate disgrace. Abdul lived in the Whitechapel district of London's East End. It contains a tightly knit Bangladeshi community which is centred around the East London Mosque. Some parts of Whitechapel are being redeveloped and sash cord used to tie the body may have been taken from a local building site. Abdur had been killed by a sharp instrument. Evidence suggests that a traditional kitchen knife, such as this dar, might have been the murder weapon. Abdur was well known in the area as a religious teacher. He came to this country in 1979 and worked part-time in the mosque. But in 1983, he left. After that, Abdur tried to make a living by teaching the Quran in people's homes. Police know that he had several arguments over debts. He was also selling saris and trinkets to women throughout the Tower Hamlets area, sometimes when their husbands weren't at home. Police say this may have caused some resentment. He was sending money regularly back to his family in Bangladesh. On at least one occasion, a contact of his in Birmingham took it for him. Maybe somebody there knows something about his death. Ramadan is the holiest month. It began in mid-April this year. It's the evening of Tuesday the 26th of April. At about 9pm, Abdur asked the family he lived with if he could make a phone call. Telephone engage. The family remembers Abdur looking through a blue book, possibly for a number. That book has not been found. When he finally got through, the end of his conversation was overheard. Abdur left the house at about 9.30. At 10 o'clock, he usually attended the mosque for prayers. But strangely, no one seems to have seen him there that night. At about 11, Abdur visited a friend in Rumford Street. He seemed nervous. Soon afterwards, he left. At about 11.30, another witness, Abdul Noor, saw him going down a staircase in a different block in Romford Street, block number 25. 
At about the same time, round the corner in Fordham Street, he was seen outside the Sillet Cash and Carry. Who was he waiting for that night, and why? Some time later, Abdul Rashid was murdered. His killers may have bought some petrol in a can, but where? His body was driven north up the A11. They probably took the Epping New Road towards the M25. In the early hours of the morning, someone may have noticed a car approaching the Robin Hood roundabout. It would have turned left towards High Beach, which is a popular area for courting couples. It would have pulled in a few hundred yards along Fairmead Road. Abdur's body was dumped just inside the wood. The flames must have been visible to any passing car. Well, Detective Superintendent Jeff Parrott is leading the inquiry into Abdur's death. Can you tell me a little bit more about what sort of man Abdur was? Yes, upon his arrival in the country, Abdur took employment at the East London Mosque. And whilst that um, employment was terminated in 1983, he was still known in the community as the Holy Man. As such, he was very, very respected and throughout this inquiry everyone has referred to him as a good man and with that in mind it's a complete mystery as why anyone should wish to kill him mm. what you really need most to know now is where Abdul went and what happened to him after that last sighting outside the cash and carry yes he obviously met someone outside the cash and carry and from that point onwards until his body was subsequently discovered we have no sightings whatsoever whatsoever what about the car park at high beach near where his body was found Yes, that is f um, used um, every evening by courting couples, in particular, often into the early hours of the morning. It may well be, and it's distinctly possible, that couples were still parked there at the time Abdul's body was dumped and uh, set fire to. It may well give rise to some embarrassment to people there, but I would urge them to come forward and give us what information they have. And I can only seek to emphasise that we will treat their information in the strictest confidence. Right, you guarantee that. And you're quite sure that if somebody was there, they could well have seen something? I'm sure they would. This burst of flame would be so obvious. Now, you haven't yet found the blue book that he looked that telephone number up in that night. Where do you think that might be? We haven't found that book. There's little doubt that that book contains um, the telephone number of the killer of Abdul Rashid. So that's a it, vital clue. It is a vital clue that. indeed, yes. And the other clue is that the body was wrapped up in a bedspread and, we, and we've had an artist draw up a detail from that. Where do you think that might come from? We haven't traced the origin of that bedspread. It's cream um, with a green uh, pattern and little doubt about that, that it, once we trace the origin of that bedspread, it will take us directly back to the killers of Abdul, Abdul Rashid again. So please do ring us if you recognise that bedspread. Now, thank you very much, Mr Parrott, for the moment. Um, Abdul Rashid's friends and associates are anxious, of course, to do everything they can to find his killers. And Abdul's 14-year-old son, Haruna Rashid, and one of the elders from the East London Mosque would like to make their own appeal in Bangladeshi. <laughs> এখন পর্যন্ত পুলিশে কোনো কিছু বাইর করতে পারে নাই আমার বাবার হত্যা সম্পর্কে কেউ কোন যদি তথ্য পাইয়া থাকেন তাহলে আপনারা দয়া প্রকাশে পুলিশকে অবগত করুন এটা আমরা কমিটি থেকে সবে অনুরোধ করা যায় যে আপনারা আগুই আর এই পুলিশের হুকা এতে কোনো লড়াই বার বা বয়ের কোনো কারণ নাই well, if you can help, please ring us. Here in the studio, waiting to take your call, as well as the detective here, we have a Bangladeshi speaker and a local community officer. The number, as always, to ring is 01811 Or you can ring Edmonton Police Station Direct on 01803 That's 01803 370 viewers rang to help on the reconstructions last month. Lots of useful information came in, though sadly none of it produced a breakthrough. But there is news on photocall, incident desk and last month's Aladdin's Cave. 
We'd appealed for information on the killing of Elaine McGee in Runcorn, and as a direct result of a call, the morning after Crime Watch, police went to an address in Leeds to interview a man. There was a chase across rooftops, and eventually a man fell through a garage roof and was trapped inside the building. When police moved in to arrest him, an officer was kicked in the groin and was quite seriously injured. A man has now been charged with murder and with causing grievous bodily harm. About 80 viewers helped to trace a man with many aliases wanted for questioning about a whole string of crimes involving deception. Several viewers called with sightings. Some days later, a Crime Watch viewer spotted a similar looking man in a charity shop in Carlisle. He quickly rang the police and the shopper was identified and arrested. He's since been charged with deception. There were 101 calls about the crossbow murder, the apparently motiveless killing of Diana Moore in Ealing in West London. One call was of particular interest to detectives who are now making what they describe as active inquiries about a particular individual. And 35 viewers rang to help trace the chief cashier from Sunderland Railway Station. Police wanted his help to find out what had happened to a large sum of money that had gone missing from the travel centre safe. A viewer called to say he'd seen a man of that description at a betting shop in Torquay. A police officer travelled straight there from the programme here at Television Centre and next day, with nothing else to go on but that link with the betting shop, the officer decided to keep an eye on the local race meeting at Newton Abbott. There, among thousands of spectators, he saw the man he wanted and arrested him. A man is now in custody, charged with theft. Now to photo call, where if you recognise someone you might help solve a fraud, a robbery or an attempted murder. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. Do you recognise this man? Watch carefully because he's not the bona fide customer he pretends to be. He's entered this jewellery shop in Kensington, London and asked to see a lady's diamond ring valued at £5,000. He's described as being of mixed race in his mid-twenties and five foot ten tall. He has a distinctive scar under his left eye. A second man then comes in. He's white, also in his mid-twenties, but slightly taller. The second man waits a short time, then they run out with the ring. Both men had London accents. If you recognise them, please call us. We'd like your help to find this man, Patrick Joseph McPartland. We think he might have vital information about the attempted murder of Philomena Chapham. She was attacked with a shovel here at her home on the Moolscombe Estate in Brighton on the 18th of September. She suffered multiple fractures and internal injuries. Later the same night, a man in the Admiral Napier pub was also attacked with a shovel and he suffered head and hand injuries. Patrick McPartland might be driving a car like this. It's a Peugeot 604 Turbo in metallic grey. Registration number JBW 489W. He's 42, 5 foot 10 tall and 20 stone. He has short greying hair and is sometimes known as Smithy or Patsy. If you know where he is, call us. On the 1st of August, this man presented a banker's draft for £16,000 to Thomas Cook's Bureau de Change in the Strand, London, and took the money in dollars. He'd got the banker's draft from a nearby branch of Barclays Bank. It was drawn on the account of the vice president of Citibank, and the man showed a forged driving licence as identification. He's in his 30s, smartly dressed, over six feet tall and slim build. If you recognise him or any of our photo call faces, call us now. And the number to ring is 01811-8055. 01811-8055. Crime against the elderly is very rare. As you get older, you're less and less likely to be the victim of a crime. That's the opposite to what many older people fear, of course. Nonetheless, senior citizens need to be aware that some people will try to take advantage of them and the rest of the community needs to be aware too. If you're a postman, a milkman, or perhaps a neighbour to someone who you think might be vulnerable, you'll see from our next film how we can all prevent these crimes by simply being alert. Helen Phillips takes up the story of one con man and one form of con that's been spreading across the country for 25 years. The winter of 1963 saw the worst of storms in living memory. Many homes were wrecked, but as a result, there weren't enough workmen to repair the damage. A new type of criminal appeared on the streets, the bogus property repairmen, or prop men, as they were called. They actually started their tricks here in Leeds, and it gradually became known as the Leeds crime. 
Today the problem's worse than ever, and it's still centred around Leeds. One command in particular has been active in eight different force areas. And last month, a conference was organised here in Leeds specifically to discuss his crimes. The man's believed to have committed up to 80 offences over a wide area. In the last year, he's stolen more than £50,000. Police have produced this photo fit of him. He's in his 40s and well built. Some people say he looks like Jeff Capes. The crimes he's committed are callous and calculated, designed to prey on the elderly and infirm, people least able to defend themselves or give detailed statements. Mick, how does he go about it? He favours the old person's type of complex. And he's got a very well rehearsed story. He's obviously looking for legitimate vans in the area. That's the type of complex there. And that's the type of van. And he always uses the same method. Oh, we're uh, blasting by the way. I'll be down shortly. Hello, is this number 42? Yes. You Mr Young? Yes, I am. I'm the heating engineer. Come to check if you need any new plugs oh, and fittings. I'm expecting this. Right, can you come in for a minute? This. You can come in. Right, thank you. Right, now let that run for five minutes and turn it off when the water turns brown. You know that, right? Well, you'll have to run it because the boiler will blow up if you don't turn it off when the water turns no, brown. That's the first time I've ever heard it like that. Right, now you stay here and watch that until it turns brown yeah. and I'll just go and check if everything's all right. It must have slipped back then and into the bedroom. That's when I think it happened. I've had to cope with it. It got me down, I tell you. It got me down. It got me very depressed. And I start, I started to pick myself up. Well, my youngest daughter, she got me pick, pick myself up when she comes. You don't get like that, Dad. The man starts early and may stay overnight in guest houses. Here's an example of a typical day. Hello. Hello. He committed his first offence in Normanton and then moved on to Sandal near Wakefield. Hello, I'm from the electricity board. I've come to check your immersion heater. Oh, come on in. By mid-morning, he was probably in Huddersfield, where he struck twice. Hello, love. Hello. I'm from the water board. We're working in the area. Did you get the letter? He stole cash and gold rings, and then went on to Sowerby Bridge. But in Halifax, something went wrong. All right, you sit down there, love. That's it. Okay. Who are you? Oh, hello. Uh, I've been next door fixing a new switch, and I just popped in to check if it's causing any interference. What tale are you telling me? Well, it's all right. You see me identification. Haven't you, love? I'll be off to check next door, then. Bye. The lady's son got a good look at his face. He committed eight crimes that day, covering the breadth of Yorkshire. He may have an accomplice who's between 30 and 40 years old, over six foot and well built. In Derbyshire, the conman's been seen getting out of a dark coloured car. Inside was a woman described as plump with fair hair. But the witness in Halifax was able to give the police a very good description of the man. For the first time on Crime Watch, we're going to try and develop it using a new home office system called eFit. It supersedes a photo fit and creates a computerised image very similar to our video fits. The system also allows for any alterations which the witness may want to make by actually changing the features on the screen. Michael, is that a good likeness? Well, the beard needs filling in on both cheeks. Uh, that left eyebrow, could, could, could that be brought round slightly? Well, I'd like to see it filled in up here. 
and, and across there. This provides us now with a very clear image of the man we're looking for. Have a good look at him again. If you recognise him, or if you have any information about this or similar cases, call us now on 01 811 8055. Or you can ring the incident room direct on Leeds 414141. That's 0532, the code for Leeds, 414141. Do call us if you know about uh, any con man, but uh, that one, let me remind you, although he looks a bit like uh, Jeff Capes, it isn't Jeff Capes himself, but a look-alike. If you're worried that you might be conned like that, the best advice is this, simply don't keep your savings in your home. Get someone you can trust to help you if you want. Put your money in a bank or in a building society. These institutions will actually pay you to keep your money safe, and you can withdraw it whenever you want. Another thing, if you don't know a visitor, ask him or her to come back at a time when you can get a friend to be with you. Incidentally, there's a new book, The Crime Watch Guide to Home Security, that Sue has written. It's published by BBC Books at £3.95. We're looking now at uh, some of the calls we've received so far. I can see that uh, somebody has rung to say they were in the high beach area of Epping Forest on that night because they remember seeing some flames. And we've had several calls on the origins of that bedspread, so we'll keep you posted on that. Well, now some more news on results from last month's programme. 31 viewers rang to identify this woman who's wanted in connection with a series of deceptions. Six viewers suggested the same name. Police now think she's Lulu Osman, who lived in Dalston in East London. The night of the Crime Watch programme, she disappeared. So if you've seen her in the last few days, please call us. And viewers also helped trace this man, Mark Geraghty, who's wanted for questioning in connection with a fraud. Aladdin's cave led to several items being recognised, including the papier-mâché table, the silver cane teapot, and these two tankards. As a result, three men have been arrested and accused of a series of crimes across the southeast of England. Guildford Police tell us they're on the verge of a whole series of arrests. So once again, we'll keep you posted. Back in July, we showed a security video of a man wanted in connection with a series of alleged deceptions. We showed him offering to sell cut price video equipment. Police in Manchester, who are watching the programme, thought they recognised the face, and a man has been charged with deception. Some viewers have very long memories. Two weeks ago, someone rang to say that they thought they'd seen a man we'd shown in March. The man was one of two who had videoed themselves in Great Yarmouth and then left the video behind when police came inquiring about frauds. One man had already been arrested as a result of Crime Watch. Now, because of our viewer, a second man has been charged with conspiracy to obtain goods by deception. Well, now to Incident Desk. This month, Merseyside police need help in the search for armed men who badly injured a security guard. Detectives in Dorset are appealing for information to help them solve a murder. And Kent police are hoping you might know where they can find a set of matchbox toys. Here's Superintendent David Hatcher. First, we need your help to catch a particularly callous rapist. On Sunday, 18th of September, a pregnant woman was raped at home in Penge, South London. The woman, whose baby is due in three months' time, was punched about the face. The rapist left behind this very distinctive, well-worn jumper. There aren't any labels on it, but it doesn't appear to be handmade. Maybe you know someone who's recently lost one like it. This is an artist's impression of the woman's attacker. He's five foot seven inches tall, about 30, slim, and was also wearing a white shirt and jeans. If you know him, call us. Next, police in Staffordshire and Warwickshire need your help to, in tracing a gang who've committed two burglaries on stately homes. They broke into Ragley Hall on the night of Monday the 4th of July. Among the items stolen was this unique Saxon brooch, worth over £12,000, and a number of snuff boxes, including these. Then, at Western Park in Shropshire on Sunday the 28th of August, the bank holiday weekend, the gang struck again. They stole over £150,000 worth of antiques, which included this 1879 snuff box and this Order of the Temsha, given by the Shah of Persia. The gang left behind this chisel, brace and bit, Perhaps you know where they were bought. There was a fair in the grounds of Western Park over that weekend. If you were there, did you see anyone acting suspiciously? There are substantial rewards for information about either of these burglaries, so if you can help, call us now. On Wednesday the 10th of August, the body of Graham Williamson was found at the back of the DHSS building in Cotlands Road, Bournemouth. 
he had been strangled. His murderer left behind this belt which was used in the attack. It's highly unusual and not made by a professional manufacturer. It could have been made at a craft fair. There's Celtic style embossing and the imitation stitching on each edge. The belt and buckle are about six or seven years old. The word Honda may have been added later, as were some of the holes. The most worn hole is for a 36 inch waist, but all of them have been used at some time, so perhaps the belt was used to strap bundles like a bedroll to a motorcycle or bike. If you recognise this belt or know anything about Graham Williamson's murder, please ring us. On Saturday before last, the 24th of September, two security guards were collecting the takings from the Gateway Food Store in Bromborough in the Wirral. They were attacked by two men with guns and robbed of £13,000. During the attack, a guard was shot, shot in the leg at point-blank range and badly hurt. Passing shoppers and children were narrowly avoided being injured. The men escaped in this beige Cortina, registration number AMU 270T. It was found abandoned about half a mile away in Hawthorne Lane. Now that car had been stolen just over an hour before from this car park at Fazakerley Hospital and that theft was caught on video. A light coloured cavalier drives into the car park and stops near where the Cortina is parked. One man gets out and has a look at the Cortina while the driver circles round. Have a closer look at that Cavalier. It's a four-door model made between 1981 and 85 with black wraparound trim. Perhaps you were visiting someone at the hospital that day and remember seeing it. A few minutes later, we think the same man came back and broke into that Cortina. Here's an artist's impression of one of the four men seen inside what we think was the same Cortina. Did you see it that afternoon? With descriptions of the two men who then abandoned the vehicle, both were white, the passenger was 5 foot 7 to 5 foot 8 inches tall, slim, with dark collar length hair. He wore black trousers and a white shirt. The driver was in his late teens or early 20s, 5 foot 8 to 5 foot 9 inches tall, with short fair hair. Do you know them or recognise the Cavalier? There's a large reward for any information leading to a conviction. And did you ever collect matchbox toys when you were young? If so, you probably didn't have any quite like these in your collection. Well, last month, 50 rare matchbox toys from the models of yesteryear series were stolen from a house in Tunbridge in Kent. These, from Chester Toy Museum, are identical to the ones stolen. This model of a 1912 Ford Model T van was made in 1983. It had the German logo, Sunlight Cipher, on the side. This Sentinel steam wagon is very scarce because late models like this were fitted with plastic wheels rather than the more common metal ones. The all-train tr traction engine had treads straight across each of the rear wheels, but by far the rarest item stolen was this Ford Model T van with the Hoover logo on the side. It didn't go on sale to the general public and is valued at £750. If you have any information about the burglary or the whereabouts of these tools, then please call us now. And a reminder of the number, 01811 Your call will be in confidence if you wish. It's 01811 A great volume of calls, particularly on the item about the con man that um, Helen Phelps introduced. Uh, there's been a sighting of him, we're told, in a uh, public library in Preston. In fact, a viewer says he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw our item, so good was the likeness. We've had a number of calls from people who believe that their relatives have also been tricked by him. There's been a, a sighting, we think, of Patrick McParlin, uh, McPartlin on a train, and uh, we've had many calls suggesting names and areas in which suspects may live for that uh, Kensington jewellery raid where the people ran out with the ring. Let's take you back now to the start of the August bank holiday, the Friday night. Were you in Hessel near Hull on Humberside that evening, or have you ever taken driving lessons in that part of the world? If so, was your instructor called Keith Slater? On the night of Friday the 26th of August, Keith answered a knock on the door of his home and someone stabbed him to death. Police hope this reconstruction will prompt people who've ever known Keith Slater to come forward and help with the inquiry. Just outside Hessel, there's a wooded area called Little Switzerland. On Friday morning, Keith and his family walked down there for a picnic. Here we go. See, both go in the end. Okay, how good is it? 
Keith had no driving lessons that morning because his car was in for service. But by lunchtime, he'd picked up his car and called into the driving school. He was self-employed and had been franchised to the school for the past 16 months. Keith was a keen rugby player who almost always wore his Hessel rugby club tie and sweater while at work. Get yourself comfy. Get your both in. Make sure your mirror's okay. That's okay. We just follow the road round. That's it, now careful. That's it. That's fine. He's got right away. He's coming first. That's smashing. That evening at 8.30, Keith's wife, Carol, finished work. Hello. She'd just started a part-time job as a cashier. There was a sale on at home base, and she'd had a difficult and busy evening. I had to remember all those codes. I had to print on codes every time I came up with the stuff. Oh. Just before nine, after a little bit of shopping, they arrived at their home on Bonacord Road. The children were staying the night with their grandmother. So the two of them came back to an empty house. But 18 months ago, Ted blocked his drawbridge for the last time and moved here to this... After dinner, Keith and Carol spent a quiet evening watching television. But shortly after 10.30, Carol, who wasn't interested in the programme, went to bed. I'm going up now. An hour later, at 11.30, Keith went up too. At midnight in Northgate, this pub barman was walking home. Can you tell me the way to Bonacord Road? I don't know, sorry. A few minutes later, at Andy Carr's taxis, close to Hessel Square. Alpha 18, 210 Buffet Road, to the Silver Card. Can you give me directions to Bonacord Road? Yes, if you go to the top, turn left. Follow the road down, and it's first on your right-hand side. Is it past the Norlin pub? No. The witnesses describe this man as stocky, with crew-cut hair, and in his 20s or early 30s. If it was you, please call us straight away to be eliminated from this inquiry. Is it the police? The police? Keith Slater. Be here. Keith! No! No! The screams were heard by a couple walking home a block away. They thought it was a party. The couple then saw a young man in a dark coat come out of Bonacord Road. At 12.25, a man was sighted heading towards the footbridge which spans the railway line and Clive Sullivan Way. It's now six weeks since the murder and police are still anxious to trace everyone who knew Keith Slater and those who learned to drive with him. In particular, they'd like to hear from one young woman. A blonde girl was seen with him several times between February and July at the National Pub on National Avenue in Hull. She was petite, described as stunning, and witnesses remember that she wore a good deal of gold jewellery. Was this you, or do you know who she was? She and Keith were also seen here in Cottingham. She was aged around 20, was smartly dressed, and may well have carried a briefcase. There's another woman detectives need to trace. On the day before the murder, a rugby friend of Keith's flashed his lights at Keith's car on First Lane Anlaby. It was about quarter to nine in the morning. Although Keith's diaries show no lessons booked for that time, a woman with fair or brownish hair was driving the car. 
Do you know who she was? Mr Lilly, were those two different women or one and the same? Well, the evidence uh, is that the descriptions do differ somewhat, but really it is something we must keep an open mind on. Now, there must be suspicions that Keith was having an affair with somebody whose boyfriend or husband didn't like it, or at least he suspected they were having an affair and, and took it out. Yes, this is obviously an area that we've looked at. Um, Enquiries have brought forth uh, many useful lines, and that is one of them, yes. Now, obviously, this woman or these women have done nothing wrong themselves. Obviously, if they don't come forward after an appeal, there will be people who are bound to suspect that they're some sort of accessories to, to the murder. But you desperately need these women to come forward. It really is imperative that these two women come forward. It is true to say that they have not committed any offence at this stage, but they really must come forward. I would urge also, of course, that if any relative or friend knows who these people are, then please, please come forward as soon as possible. It really is imperative that we trace these two people. OK, now the man himself, who seems to have known something about the area, we've got quite a good description of him, haven't we? Yes, we have an artist impression which was done by Carol Slater. Uh, Carol saw the assailant fighting with her husband as she came down the stairs having heard the disturbance. And um, she made an artist impression uh, as a result of that. What I would say, of course, is that that is exactly as Carol remembers him. I wouldn't doubt, uh, feel for one minute that he has such starry eyes if he's sat at home now or indeed in a pub. But we must say that is as Carol remembers him in the heat of the moment. Now, someone must have suspicions about a boyfriend, a husband, somebody they know who looks a bit like that, but one thing is that he must have got covered in blood that night. Yes, Carol was covered in blood because Keith was um, bleeding quite profusely and she was covered in blood as she helped him back in. The assailant must have been well covered in blood. What I would say is that there must be someone sitting at home who knows that someone came home during the early hours of Saturday the 27th of August covered in blood, acting suspiciously. They must hold a question mark against such a person and I would urge them, please contact us here or at the police station as soon as possible. If you think you know who that man is, if you think you can help, if you think you know who those women are, if you knew Keith Slater and haven't yet contacted the police, and above all, if you know that woman or those women that were seen with him, please call us right away, 01811 or call the incident room at Hull that's on 501-222. That's 0482, the code for Hull, 501-222. But certainly a lot of people seem to have been ringing about the case of the con man who pretends to be a gas border official or a water border official and the like and preys on old people up in the north. We've had quite a lot of calls who actually have suggested names and addresses for him. Uh, both the police officer and the store detective, too, have phoned. Both say that they think they may have had dealings with him in the past. Also on the Penge rape case, there seem to be possible sightings of him too. In our next two cases tonight, we're going to be showing security videos of crimes committed by men who police believe are particularly dangerous, and they urgently need your help to identify them. Here again is David Hatcher with our second set of photocall faces. We need your help to identify this man who strolled into a building society in East London on the 12th of August and escaped with over £1,000 but he was caught on film by a new sharp-definition security camera. Look at him closely. That black leather jacket is said to be good quality. He's described as being five foot seven tall, slim, with short, dark hair. On the 20th of September, at another London branch of the same building society, these men also got away with around a thousand pounds. They were very panicky, and were worried that if they strike again, someone will be hurt. The gunman is 25 to 30 years old, five foot eight inches tall and of stocky build. His accomplice is younger, in his early twenties, and of medium build. There's a reward for information in this and the previous case, so if you know who they are, call us now. And do you know where this woman is? Her name is Mandy Beavers. In February, she and her boyfriend terrorised and robbed a 74-year-old man. He lived alone here at these old people's flats in Middlesbrough, where he was confined to a wheelchair. After Beavers had befriended him, she and her boyfriend robbed him and threatened him with a hammer. In August, her boyfriend was sentenced to three years' imprisonment, but it's thought Beavers has left the Cleveland area and may be in London. Perhaps you've seen her. She's 19 and 5 foot 4 inches tall. She has lots of tattoos, including the word Chris on her right hand. If you know her, please call us. Police in Somerset need your help in tracing this man. 
In April, he opened a flex account with the Nationwide Anglia Building Society in Hammersmith in the name of Ibi Kunli Temitopi Ogun Banjo. On Thursday, the 2nd of June, he deposited a stolen cheque worth nearly £20,000. It had gone missing in transit between a department store in Taunton and a shoe shop in Hackney, East London. The money was withdrawn 11 days later. He's described as West African, slim build, 5 foot 11 inches tall, mid-twenties and casually dressed. If you recognise Mr Ogun Banjo or any of our other photo call faces, give us a ring. Here's the number 018118055 and the lines are open now. They'll stay open till midnight on 018118055. We've had a large number of calls on the Penn's rate, people suggesting where that distinctive pullover might have been bought and also uh, a number of people who've suggested that they know something about where that belt might have, have come from in the murder of Graham Williamson in Bournemouth. Uh, also on that uh, con man, and we had somebody who thought they'd seen him in a library, that for a variety of reasons the detectives want that person to please ring back again. Sue. Well, please keep trying if you've found the lines engaged when you've been trying to ring, or you could ring the relevant local police numbers. They're on CFAX if you have that on page 186, or you could write to us at Crime Watch UK, BBC Television, London W12 8QT. And of course, if you have any information on any crime, you should call your local police. There's more news coming in now. We'll, of course, bring you the latest with Crime Watch Update. That's at 11.45. Do join us if you can. The next Crime Watch proper will be a month from now, Thursday the 3rd of November. We always try to point out that crime is actually rarer than many people think. And at last, the official statistics are showing that some categories of crime are starting to go down. Please don't wait for next month's Crime Watch to tell the police if you know something wrong is going on. If we all help others as we hope they'd help us, we will crack crime together. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares. Do please sleep well. Good night. Good night. <laughs>